Hi everyone, this is Chris and this is Cathode Biased episode 2. Um, here in uh, sunny Miami, Florida. And uh, yeah, I have a couple things in my mind I just want to cover today, kind of in the tube and vintage uh, sort of hi fi world. Um, yeah, so I've been kind of busy. I had this week off for the holidays and I've uh, just been uh, uh, trying to get the gear I have down here in Miami uh, up and running and, and working properly. And that includes uh, one of my projects that's been kind of ongoing for a while, and it's uh, fixing this piece right here, the Macintosh MC240 which I acquired a few months ago. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a second, but it's kind of like a couple of things I want to talk about today is maybe one is, uh, is why you would want it to restore uh, a vintage piece versus actually just keeping it 100% um, original, and then maybe two, talk a little bit about uh, what I actually did on this piece. So yeah, so I bought this piece, I kind of like always on the lookout, as a lot of people are that are in this hobby for, for uh, you know, gear that's coming up on for sale locally, specifically in Craigslist or Facebook, and usually I strike out. It's almost always a dead end. But uh, one day I was just hunting around on, on Craigslist and happened to type in Marantz in the search, and then a Marantz Seven and a MC Two Forty, both of which you see here, showed up in one ad. <laughs> it was very rare, and it said make an offer. It didn't have any specific price or anything, and so. Um, I texted the guy right away, and he was just came on um, Craigslist, and I said, like, I can be there first thing tomorrow morning, like 8 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. He said, all right, great, fine. I said, oh, so I jumped in the car, um, drove down there, and uh, actually drove to the north about an hour, actually, uh, up sort of closer to West Palm Beach, and uh, uh, kind of made a deal on both pieces. I think I got a really fair price. Uh, it was kind of one of those deals where both parties came away. I felt like I paid more than I wanted. He felt like he got less than he wanted. Uh, but ultimately, I got both pieces home, and one thing I found out was the Marantz is actually, I didn't realize this at the time, um, actually thanks to Marantz History and a few other people on Instagram, I was able to uh, determine the sort of the manufacturing date of the, the Marantz approximately. It was was a first year production in 1958, it's also a green color, which are highly desirable prices of it the value of it seems to be fairly unknown because they don't come up very often but i've seen some pretty big numbers put out there for the green Marantz 7. so um both pieces i got them kind of in unknown condition and the, the the seller didn't have them set up to demo um he, he didn't seem like he seemed like he was in the high five but, but it had been a long time and he was looking just to get rid of a bunch of stuff and uh so he just didn't have them ready to demo so my assumption always if you can't demo something and even if you can if I'm buying a hi-fi pieces, it just doesn't work, right? I can't make an assumption that it's a perfectly working piece. Even if maybe you have the documentation and everything else with the piece, if I can't see it running and working myself, I just make the assumption that it's going to have to be refurbished. Um, and these pieces have definitely got some hours on them. And it's kind of like how I like to buy my gear. There's really, like, I think there's two factions of people that buy hi-fi gear. One that's looking for the absolute pristine piece, like it was maybe never used and just put on a shelf for... 60 years and then there's sort of people like myself that actually like a little bit of the heritage of it and actually like the pieces that have been used over time and i can definitely tell based on what i've seen on both these pieces that they've they've um they've definitely been used and have quite a few hours on them with that said they're both really um totally functional pieces there's nothing significantly wrong with either one of them and um i took a look inside of both of them and, and kind of made the, the decision to bring them up slowly on a variac and and get them running, which I did, and um, and they worked okay for a while. I had no problems with uh, running each for about a month. Then I came back down to Miami and hooked up to the MC240, um, the Macintosh, and uh, it, it just died on me, right? I was like, oh, no, what happened? Um, so basically thought I had to do a, basically a full power supply recap. That was my plan. Probably should have opened it up initially because uh, once I got in there, I realized um, a lot of the work had already been done. But there were a few things that had been left um, for me to kind of finish up, and there was really two major problems with it. One was the uh, there's a there's a thermosistor. Not all vintage tube amps and vintage pieces have them, but the Macintoshes do have a thermosistor, which basically brings up the voltages in the unit slowly when it powers up, so it doesn't doesn't jolt like the 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 whole power supply and the the and uh, basically um, the capacitors and transformers with full 
AC all at once. It brings up the power fairly, fairly slowly, maybe over a couple seconds. Um, actually, some refurb kits have thermosistors in there as an upgrade to, like, say, Fisher's. Uh, sometimes they put them in, sometimes they don't. But uh, well, the Magnetosh came with one stock. And the one I had in there, I noticed it was previously it was it was damaged, but it seemed to work. But it didn't work for long. It was it was it had failed by the time, and that was what was causing the problem, and why it wouldn't power on. Um, the second thing I saw in there was, uh, while most of the power supply caps and electrolytics had been replaced in the 240, there was still had the original selenium rectifier. Maybe I'll talk about selenium rectifiers in another uh, episode at some point, but. My general feeling with the selenium rectifiers and maybe just upgrading in general is like they are they are known to be toxic. It's basically um, you know an early version of, of a diode, um, basically of a, of of, uh, of um, solid state rectification, basically. And when they go, they basically release a toxic gas. So that's one thing and one reason why I'm a little bit hesitant to run gear that with the original selenium rectifier. I mean, I enjoyed uh, vintage hi-fi and tube amps. But I also don't want to get sick for one either, so um, I'd rather uh, take a little bit of precaution and replace um, the, sil the, the selenium rectifiers with a diode. And the, re the, the ironic thing is the modern diode costs literally like five cents that you put into one of these things. Uh, I think suspect back in the 60s, the diodes were probably, or the selenium rectifier probably cost more than the tube. And that's why some uh, amplifiers used... Uh, uh, tube rectification versus like uh, this amplifier uses solid state rectification. Uh, it was probably just a cost thing. It was probably more expensive to use a selenium rectifier, which ironically today, solid state rectification with technology advances is basically free. Um, so um, what basically I got some information, just to get a little background about myself, I talked about my intro in my last um, sort of video, but a little bit more about myself as far as my repair skills. I consider myself to be an intermediate when it comes to doing repairs. Um, I basically started last year, I've done about five or six tube amps now, and done a lot of research and reading up on sort of tube amp architecture and just following a lot of videos on YouTube. So I'm way off of being like um, an advanced um, restorer of one of these. There's definitely people that do this professionally that have a lot more knowledge, have done this for a long time than I do. So I consider myself to be an intermediate. Not exactly a beginner. Uh, when I started with my first uh, KX100 earlier this year, I was bone stock beginner. Didn't even know what I was looking at and when I opened up the piece. Uh, but had a lot of advice both from my family and also from people on Instagram who I'll actually uh, uh, call out in the, in the notes on this. That really helped me a lot. I really appreciate those the people in the community. That's what's awesome about this community. There's a lot of people out there that will jump in and help you out and, and give you some advice if you need help on, on getting going. But... Uh, I was able to get that original KX100 going and did a bunch of amps after that, and so basically landed here at this um, MC240. So, but I did this need some power supply work, and um, there was an excellent video online from Blue Glow Electronics on this exact model, on the exact upgrades. He used a kit to do the upgrades. I basically just followed along with what was in the kit and bought it myself. Um, it turns out that it's about a wash of whether that's cheaper or not. If I was to do it again, I probably would have just bought the kit. But it also turned out I didn't need a lot of the pieces in the kit. That's, like I said, kind of like my mistake, not realizing that a lot of work had already been previously done on this. But um, what I did uh, find out from um, sort of Blue Glow, Glow Electronics was how to do the, the replacement of the selenium diode properly on this amplifier. And one thing you do need to do is that the selenium rectifier has a higher uh, impedance or has a higher, sorry, sorry a resistance um, than the diode, so um, you do have to put a resistor in to actually drop the the, the voltage, uh, the negative negative voltage on the bias circuit slightly, um, and it basically just takes a 470 ohm um, uh, 470 ohm resistor in series with the diode. Um, Blue Glow Electronics goes all into it very much detail, so I won't do it here. But it's a it's a pretty simple upgrade, so. Um, between putting the thermosistor in, oh, the other thing I want to know with the thermosistor, I did quite a bit of research and found out there is a company in the U.S. Um, as you might know, if you know me, I have a house in, also in Lake Tahoe, uh, in the Nevada side. And it turns out the, there's a company that makes thermosistors not far from my house in, in, in Tahoe, in, in Carson City, Nevada, called Meritherm. And I was able to spec out uh, almost the identical specification that this requires from them. So I was able to get a made in Carson City 
uh, thermosistor, which is uh, kind of cool. I like to use American made components and American made electronics whenever I can. So, um, yeah, after that, I went through the whole system, just checked out the the voltages on, on the power supply, make sure everything was correct and everything was almost dead on, right? I mean, this, the, the specifications that was that Blue Glow gave me just worked basically perfectly. And, uh, and all the, the, the voltages for the cathodes on, on the, on the uh, tubes were perfect. The, the bias supply was perfect. Everything was basically perfectly within spec. So uh, after that, I felt pretty confident to put it back into circulation and put it back into rotation today. And I've been listening to it all day, and it's been running just absolutely beautifully. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of like a little bit of the background on the MC240. Um, I call it the Big Mac on uh, Instagram, if you follow me on Instagram. Uh, the other thing I kind of would say is it's kind of changed my mind a little bit about Macintosh in general. I've always been sort of a Marantz person, but I wouldn't say that the, the, the Macintosh is really well built on the inside and very easy to, to work on, and the layout is very straightforward. Like, the internals of it, like a Marantz 8B, like I love the Marantz 8, I have two Marantzes, a Marantz 8 and Marantz 8B, and two preamplifiers. Uh, two Marantz 7s, but I have to admit the, the Marantz 8 is a lot more complicated to and with the layout the inside of like what's going on and what everything where everything is laid out. It's kind of a little more crowded underneath the cover. So the, the I'd say the Macintosh from ease of working on is even superior to the Marantz. I think it's just uh, really well thought out and from an interior interior kind of layout and, and wiring standpoint, which kind of changed my opinion about the Macintosh a little bit. I know the Macintosh is kind of considered a little bit more of a grunt amplifier where the Marantz is a little more subtle. That's debatable. We can talk about the different qualities of amplifiers in a different videos some other day. But uh, there's other one other topic I really want to talk about, and that's um, why you would do any upgrades on um, a vintage piece or if you just should just leave it original and leave it totally stock. Um, I think there's you have to ask yourself why you'd want to leave a piece of 100% original. I think there's a couple reasons, really two reasons. One reason is you want to hear how the piece sounded originally without any modifications, assuming that the original designers knew exactly what they were doing with the selection of components. So you don't want to make any changes to that component selection. That's one idea. I think the second idea is basically you're buying it as a museum piece, right? You don't really plan on using it. You want to keep it original. And you want to have all the original components in it. So if you're to look at it internally, how it was built, everything was just as it came from the factory. I have no real concerns about either of those, if that's what your intention is. I just want to say regarding sort of the first part is like, if you're, re if you're really your idea is like you want to hear a 60-year-old amplifier, how it originally sounded, I think you got to go in a time machine and go back 60 years, quite frankly. Because no matter, even if it's sat in a box in Nevada in a super dry environment and it was never turned on for 60 years i guarantee i have a morance that was like that and i actually used it for and i regretted it now because in this as is condition because um the basically electrolytic plasters will dry out and they'll change their the, the basically their their capacitance will, will decrease and they'll leak uh, ac voltage over time so basically um they, they basically wear out over a long period of time so you're, you're never really any amplifier, which basically includes all amplifiers made in the 60s and earlier, has electric lytic capacitors in them, and they just aren't—they just aren't going to last for 60 years and be in original state. So the thought that you're going to hear the amplifier how it originally was, I think, is is kind of a stretch and it's fairly unlikely. So I think if you really want to hear the amplifier, your best bet is to like try to replace it with high quality components that match the original specs as closely as possible and make as few sort of uh, circuit changes as you possibly can. If anything's out of spec, I, I recommend replacing it. Otherwise, you, you probably aren't going to hear it in the same fashion that the designer really intended. Um, with that said, there's a lot of debate about what to do with coupling capacitors. Um, in this piece, I decided to leave all the original coupling capacitors in there. They're non electrolytic capacitors. Um, they're known to last a long time, and they may or may not affect the tone of the amplifier. So. Um, while I do recommend replacing the electrolytics and the selenium rectifier in the power supply of pretty much any vintage amplifier, I think it's debatable and you, we could go back and forth all day, maybe I'll have another video about that, whether it's really necessary to replace the coupling capacitors in vintage amplifiers. 
But that is my opinion. I think the other idea is like you want to have a museum piece. That's fine. That's not my gig. I like to listen to my amplifiers. I like to keep them running. I like them in well-used condition. I don't prefer like perfect museum pieces. I have bought pieces like that in the past. And I kind of regret it because I feel guilty every time I use it. I feel like, oh my God, I'm putting wear on these brand new Telefunken 12AX7s from 60 years ago. Or, or um, maybe these capacitors aren't don't sound right because they're worn out or whatever. I, like, I'm concerned about... Or blowing out a, a filter cap, which I did on my Marantz. I had an absolutely mint condition Marantz 8B. Everything original on it. Original tubes, everything original, and a filter cap blew on it. So, and, and luckily it didn't take the transformers with it, but it could have. So, I don't really recommend listening to a vintage gear in 100% original condition. That's just my recommendation. And if you find something in unknown condition, I wouldn't just plug it in and start turning it on using. You kind of need to know what's going on with the piece. You kind of want to bring it up slow on a variac, and you kind of want to test it out before you bring it up to full power and, and use it. Um, that's just my recommendation. Sometimes I don't always follow my recommendations, specifically with this Fisher R200 behind me, which is 100% original, but also um, doesn't have the big uh, output tubes that, a, that an amplifier has. So um, that's just my recommendation. I'd say like I would I would I wouldn't just grab a piece that's in unknown condition and put it into 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 use. Um, so that's what I'm gonna cover today. Uh, hopefully, I can do some more of these. And uh, if you think this is cool, subscribe um, and leave a comment. Uh, if not, tell me too. Maybe I said something that offended you. So oh, the one other thing I want to say about this is I really want to be sort of inclusive with these videos. Uh, my concern really about the hi-fi world in general is just there's a lot of um, sort of I don't know, elitism, I'd say. And one of my concerns is to try to avoid that elitism. Like, I don't have a lot of concerns about what type of gear you run. I mean, if you run modern gear or if you run vintage gear, that's all cool. Like, I don't really judge based on the type of gear you have or what you really enjoy. It's more like, this is what I enjoy. I enjoy vintage vintage gear, but I'm not here to tell anybody that vintage gear is better than the other gear. So, um, yeah, so that's really my goal is kind of be more inclusive with these videos and just be more informative. So... Uh, yeah, I hope everyone's having a good holiday, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, and uh, yeah, um, have a good one.